if you go back to our narrative of being, you know, a, a 1970s scientist trying to understand this process, then it's clear that RAS is a gene that's often hyperactivated in cancers. So the question is, what role does RAS play in signaling, normal cell signaling and cancer cell signaling? So that's what we're looking at here. So, so RAS was um, known to be an oncogene, meaning its hyperactivation was important in cancer and it was often identified from cancer samples and tumor samples. Now, RAS was known to be a molecular switch. So we, we talked about how um, it's a switch molecule and it can activate other things. But the question is, um, how was RAS involved in signaling to the nucleus? I mean, was RAS involved in signaling to the nucleus? And if so, what were the upstream factors that signal to RAS? And what are the downstream signals that RAS signals to? So we're getting back to this idea of an external ligand binding to a receptor and then activating things in the cytosol to turn on genes. We know we have RAS, and that's an important switch molecule that's, that's often perturbed in cancers. So the research, researchers back in you know, say the 1970s were trying to work on the upstream things signaling to RAS and the downstream signaling from RAS, and just trying to put RAS into context as well. And the effect of, um, of this normal signaling is to drive processes such as apoptosis, cell migration, cell growth, um, cell adhesion, and, and cells differentiating into different cell types. So we have a situation where a small amount of ligand, a very small amount of growth factor, leads to these large-scale changes in cell phenotype. And the question is, what is the signaling pathways that cause um, these large-scale changes. So this is the, the headspace I guess we had at the time is that there's got to be something on the, on the plasma membrane that's picking up these growth signals and then somehow um, once the growth factors have been detected they're um, leading to activation of RAS. Okay, so this is upstream signaling down to RAS and at some point, RAS is able to signal through some unknown pathway to activate gene um, tr uh, transcription factors and gene expression. So we have a round of transcription giving us a round of translation and some new protein synthesis. And this new protein synthesis is then able to cause this change in cell phenotype, whether that be growth or differentiation or apoptosis or whatever pathway has been activated. So we'll look at some of the evidence that started to uncover this pathway to and from RAS. So just as a, um, a reminder, I, I've shown a slide similar to this before in one of the earlier um, lectures. And we were looking at RAS as a switch molecule. And depending on whether um, so when RAS is bound to GDP, it's inactive and it's off. And when it's bound to GTP, it's active or it's on. So in the active state, it then signals to downstream factors leading to gene expression. But something has to signal from upstream, from the receptor, down to RAS to, to switch it on. So one of the things that leads to RAS activation is going to be um, nucleotide exchange. And what leads to RAS inactivation is nucleotide hydrolysis. And, and RAS, and we've discussed that those processes earlier. So we know that RAS is a um, protein with this nucleotide embedded in its structure. This, um, and, and if it's GDP, then RAS is off. And if it's GTP, RAS is on, because the, um, the, the, the form of this nucleotide causes these loops to be either exposed or, or hidden. And when the loops are exposed, then it can bind to something to activate that something. 
So the signaling from upstream from the receptor down to RAS, the, the, an, an understanding of what that signaling came from an unlikely source. So you had, um, you've got, you know, different um, areas of molecular biology. The one area that was being studied in molecular biology was um, were people who were studying the model organism Drosophila um, melanogaster. So this is fruit fly. Okay, and fruit fly has a very short lifespan. It's very quick to study multiple generations of fruit fly, and you can mutate the flies and look for changes in phenotype. You know, the people will look for change in eye color or change in the wing shape, or you know, after, after mutation, and then doing genetic experiments, they would track back to what the gene mutation was that caused the phenotypic change. So. Drosophila was a great model organism for studying um, how gene mutation leads to different phenotypic changes. And typically they were studying development in, in, in fruit fly. So at some point during the study of eye development in um, fruit fly, they uncovered a gene called sevenless. And I'll exp so the, the the cells that make up the eye have a have this particular um, structure to them, and when the this particular gene is mutated, you get a different structure, and the omatidia, this structure in the eye, fails to form. So people identified the mutation. They then went back, looked at the genome, and identified what the gene was leading to this this seemingly, you know, interesting but not related to cancer phenotype, you know, something. And what they identified was a receptor on the, on the, on the, in the plasma membrane of these cells, and this receptor turned out to be a tyrosine kinase receptor. And if, if, if you remember from previous lectures, tyrosine kinase receptors were thought to be um, potent oncogenes, and involved in cell signaling to pick up these growth factors to trigger cell signaling. So suddenly, one of these molecules, that's a tyrosine kinase receptor, was, was detected in another model organism. And it was strikingly similar in gene sequence to the epidermal growth factor, which is one of these um, receptors that drives cell growth. So suddenly, the, the mammalian molecular biologists were interested in the discoveries that the Drosophila um, molecular biologists were um, uncovering. So this is um, just looking at the cell structures um, within eye development of the fruit fly. And in the normal wild type, there's these seven um, structures here. And in the mutation they detected, there were only six. So it was, they called it sevenless because it didn't have seven. Okay. So they identified um, that there was a tyrosine kinase receptor that when you mutate it, it leads to this different phenotype, which leads to a different eye structure. And then the human geneticists had realized that sevenless was very similar to um, epidermal growth factor. So um, the, the Drosophila geneticists also identified other um, mutations in other genes which gave the same phenotypes. So that is a dead ringer then, that you've got different proteins in the same pathway being mutated, because a different mutation has the same phenotype, and therefore it's probably affecting the same pathway. So, um, so in, in, in a very um, amusing fashion, they called one of these other mutants son of sevenless, because it had a very similar um, phenotype to the sevenless mutation, and um, so we had this gene called son of sevenless as well, which was of interest because it was in a pathway downstream of this tyrosine kinase receptor. So what the Drosophila geneticist knew was that um, they had a tyrosine kinase receptor that signaled down to this other mutant they detected, which coded for a gene called son of sevenless. So they had a bit of a pathway here. And what 
really triggered the interest of the mammalian bi biochemists was son of sevenless, son of sevenless. The function of this protein, it was a nucleotide exchange protein. And if you remember back to RAS, it's the nucleotide exchange factors that activate RAS. So, um, so what they were looking at now was a signaling molecule activating a receptor and going through some different proteins to activate a guanine exchange factor. And the guanine exchange factor causes RAS to potentially lose its GDP, so it exchanges its GDP for GTP. So the, um, the guanine exchange factor, when it interacts with RAS, it basically pushes the, G, the nucleotide out of the protein. And then when it's replaced by another nucleotide, the other nucleotide, well, GTP is present in the cell in a much higher concentration. So when it's replaced, it's normally replaced by the GTP rather than the GDP. And then that leads to the activation of RAS. Okay. So I don't want to give you too much information, but effectively, through exchange of the nucleotide, there's a very high chance of replacing the GDP with GTP. And the SOS gene, the son of sevenless, was a guanine exchange factor. And if you think back to some information I gave you earlier in the activation of RAS, to go from the GDP to the GTP, I was telling you that there were these guanine exchange factors that lead to the activation of RAS. And it turns out that the um, Drosophila geneticists had uncovered um, a receptor leading to the activation of a guanine exchange factor. And it was the, the yeast geneticists that actually came in and went, hang on, we've identified a, a protein that's similar to SOS, which is a guanine exchange factor. So, so the yeast geneticists kicked in here to help identify the function of the SOS protein. All we need to know is that we're now starting to uncover some of the potential upstream signaling from um, that, that picks up the growth factor and signals down to RAS, to activate RAS. So the question was then, what were the, some of the missing genes involved in this pathway? And without going into the ins and outs of how they were discovered, I can just tell you that the some of these adapter proteins that join this signal pathway together, there's a protein called SHEC, and there's a protein called, well I call it GRB2, but I'm told it's pronounced GRAB2. Okay, So when you put all of this together, we have a signaling pathway from a growth factor through a tyrosine kinase receptor, through to one of these adapter proteins, which then lead to the, um, to, um, the nucleotide exchange factor activating RAS. So through this um, research across different you know, um, domains, people are, are now put together um, one of these um, canonical, one of these well-characterized um, growth um, um, signaling pathways leading to the activation of RAS. So to understand this signaling pathway in a bit more detail, one of the questions is, what is the role of the tyrosine kinase receptor? So I think people are starting to get an idea that when you activate one of these receptor molecules, they notice that the receptor itself was being phosphorylated. So you had this autophosphorylation of the receptor in response to the binding of the growth factor. And the question is, you know, what, what role did this um, phosphorylation, how, how is it important in terms of driving the signal? And um, we'll look at that.